all, I'm, I'm Kenneth evans Trump, and I w work at Brookhaven National Labs, and I was asked to say something about myself. Um, let's see. Um, I'm very happy to speak at this African School of Physics because actually I have strong ties to, to Africa, Ghana in particular. Um, my, my father is from Ghana and I, I was born in the US, but I did um, a large fraction of my, uh, un, um, before, before, before college, you know, high school, and I would say half my um, elementary school in, in Ghana and West Africa. And then I came to the US to study. And that's how I ended up here. So um, this talk is not kind of the usual talk I give. Usually, I think most of us give the specialized talks in our areas. And th this one's a little broad. I mean, when I was asked to speak at this, I, I put myself in the position. And I, I imagine that um, um, many of you out there almost have no idea uh, what um, what techniques are available at synchrotrons. And so I kind of, I, I divided this, I have this one and a second talk next week. In this talk, I'm going to try to, um, uh, to go over some of the, basically introduce a little bit the synchrotron just briefly, but then spend most of the time talking about the, the techniques that one might be able to use there to study materials, since that's what a lot of us do, and, and why. In fact, what are the advantages of doing it at, at, this, at the synchrotron? And, and then in the next talk next, next week, then I will look more at, I mean, I work at a beam line, right? We built a beam line. Um, and, and so I, I, I'll get more from the, the ring and the beam line side of view, how you make the, the the, the photons to, to use and how you set up the equipment and stuff, you know, what, what kind of, you know, that, that part of it. So that, that's next week. Normally I would do this the other way around, right? Because of that's my kind of my, my day job. But I think this, I wanted to let you know what you might be able to, you, you may have some problem you're working on out there and you, you may not have known that you could just write a proposal to a synchrotron and come and do the experiment. So I'm here to tell you that. In any case, okay. So, right, so, so okay, let's just go in. And um, so this is what a synchrotron looks like. This is NSLS2, um, where I work. And uh, it's in Long Island. Uh, your, your, yeah. your slides are not uh, moving. They are not changing. We are still huh. stuck on the first one. Still stuck on the first one. And the layout, maybe as well. So I don't know if you have two screen. Maybe it's just switching. Mm. So, so you could let, let me go back. To... Yeah. When you go back, oh, now they are moving. Uh -huh. Now it's changing, but okay. it's not completely full screen. But I think we can let's just continue. Mm -hmm. Christine, you know is what? okay. Like uh, that? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of I'll zoom it up. See if it will help. So it'll be almost like full screen. Just a minute. Hopefully, oops. Yeah. Yeah, that's that I'll is kill cool. this guy also. Uh, can I kill this? Hmm. Oh yeah, this is how I do it. There we go. So it's close enough. Okay, so ooh. yeah, that if you zoom, you may have problem when you go side after side. Okay, so the, 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 the briefly the main characteristics of a synchrotron, and please feel free to ask questions. Um, oh, and I should mention, first time, I'm, because it's a, I don't give this kind of talk, I have no idea about the timing. I, I hope it works out in terms of the timing. Okay, briefly, um, the, the key, one of the key things about the synchrotron is the total flux that comes out of it. It's a lot of power that comes out of it. The, the next thing is the range of wavelengths that can come out of synchrotron. I'm gonna go all these in a little more detail later on. So for example, the total flux that comes out is actually enough to melt samples. You know, if, if you put a, um, a, a sample right at where the, 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 synchrotron, the, the synchrotron beam comes out and the total output is measured in kilowatts. And so actually the, the job of the beam line is to kind of make it more useful, right? You, you, you take the part of the light you, you care about and you know, you, you, Throw away, throw away what you don't want. The next thing is the range of wavelengths. 
And wavelengths and photon energy are interchangeable with this, uh, you know, HC over lambda. And so actually I'll show you a plot in the next page. And the nice thing about um, X-ray is, is that the wavelength is comparable to in interatomic spacing. And, and the energies are comparable with the binding energies of many elements. So you can play interesting, you can play there, you can play interesting games by essentially changing the um, effective re refractive index, for example. So th those two features are sort of very important about the very important advantage of doing, doing work at a synchrotron, especially compared to a lab source where you have just one wavelength. So here's, an, here's a plot that just shows you that graphically. You know, you've, you've got a plot here that goes from 10 keV to 100 keV. So basically that's what's coming out of the source. These are, these are different specific kinds of sources. We'll go, may go over them in the next, in the next week's section. Each, each one has slightly different properties. Um, and then basically you, you, you pick the wavelengths that you're interested in for your experiment. So, um, here is uh, something that shows you. Oh, by the way, does the does my cursor show up? I'm yes. trying to move a cursor. Yeah, good, good. So basically, the range of wave, um, uh, you know, range of length scales of of the of the wavelength, right? So um, X rays, it's around one angstrom, ten to the minus ten. As you go to lower energies, it gets longer. And, and they, they have a little, little pictures here that show you the scale of the object. So infrared, it's, you know, I have a needle, I guess. And uh, visible, it's um, 500 nanometers, for example. And this is uh, one angstrom. And, okay, so that sets the scale. So I, I, I kind of mentioned this and we'll, we'll come back to it again later. The, the, the point I wanted to make is you know, given the, um, the different elements, the elements all have their different binding energies. And, and um, you can, so here's say, for example, if you, if you had some, let's say copper K alpha, um, which has a, 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 a binding energy of around eight KV, that is sort of a very natural, um, falls right in with, within the um, synchrotron spectrum. And so you can do things like if, if you're if you're hunting for for copper in your sample, uh, you can basically tune to just above the, the the K edge, and you can look and see if there's in fact copper in the material. So that's one of those advantages. So um, well, we have to kind of prepare a little bit, and so I'm going to um, <clears throat> just remind you a little tiny bit about uh, some stuff, which is. Um, how do the photons generated at um, the synchrotron interact with material? And it's, it's stuff you already know. So um, we have here, so it's basically imagine the nucleus, which is pretty heavy, the electrons pretty light. There's that binding energy of 8 kV or something. And that's like the spring on, on which the electron is uh, you know, tied, to the, tied to the nucleus. And so you can write a simple, uh, differential equation. There's the forcing function. There's the the spring, and there's a damping. The damping would come from the thing from it re-radiating. It's a very simplistic picture, but contains most of the essential physics that you need to sort of understand the material. So um, you drive it. Um, so along comes a photon, wiggles the electrons. And the main one point is that because the nucleus is heavy, you basically only see the electrons as they move uh, a lot. And the next thing I want to point out is, if you look at the bottom here, you'll see that um, the, the amplitude the, the, uh, is gonna change sign with it when you're below and above the binding energy, right? So the, the oscillations will have a certain phase with respect to the incidence. And then when you go past the um, binding energy, it's, it's a different phase. So th that was for one electron. So now, an atom actually consists of a whole sum of, and this sum of a J is all, all over all the, all those, um, those K and L orbitals that I was talking about earlier, that I showed you the picture of earlier. So you can construct, you know, you can 
construct uh, the response of a whole atom uh, in, in this manner. Basically, in one of the things is each level will have a different um, binding uh, fre uh, frequency. So it turns out when you, when you, you know, if you just do all that and I'm just, um, just sort of introducing this, you know, there's the refractive index, right? So when, when you're at low energies, which is, you know, visible light, for example, you know, refractive index is higher than, higher than one, say one and a half for glass, right? For most materials, it's higher than one. And every time you go, through, every time, now you, you're increasing the photon energy on this axis here, or I should say the frequency on this axis. Um, when you, every time you go through one of those, um, those shells with the, with the binding energy, you get a drop in the uh, refractive index. And eventually, and every time you, you, know, you go through the different shells, you eventually come to where we are most of the time with, with, with hard x-rays in a synchrotron. It turns out that if you go through the numbers and basically, um, you, know, you, ba you, can, you can view, um, many materials can be, can be viewed essentially as a bag of electrons, right? So, you know, the materials differ in, so to first order, they differ in how dense they are, how many electrons are in it. So like tungsten is very heavy, have, has a lot of electrons, carbon is very light, very few. Um, so the density comes in, just a couple of uh, constants. In any case, the main point is refractive index is less than one, but it's very close to one. The difference is something like 10 to the minus five. And that has an important um, uh, consequence later. So I'm going to say something about the, the other properties of the synchrotrons, which um, are, are sort of, I would say, perhaps less familiar to people who do, who don't work at a synchrotron, but work with x-rays, for example. So um, the, the key property of synchrotrons that we, that keep improving from each new one that gets built, uh, I would say it's really the emittance, you know. So the, the, there's the angular divergence. So he, imagine you have a source. Now this is a laser is essentially almost a perfect source for, for most things. The synchrotrons are not lasers yet. We're working on that, but they're not there yet. So you've got, you know, if you've got a light source, you've got an angular divergence to the light that comes out, sigma prime. You've got the physical size of the source, sigma. And sigma sigma prime um, is something that's it's usually conserved in an, ex, you know, in an, in an experiment. You sort of can't do better than that. Than, than that. If you start out, your, your optics will always make that number worse. And so the goal of the people, you know, is each generation of synchrotrons gets built, they try to make this emittance closer, uh, smaller and smaller, and eventually hit this diffraction limit. And I think a few, I think we hit it, the diffraction limit in one direction at some energies in our ring, but there are other facilities that are diffraction limited all the time. And that, that's really, one, you know, really where you want to be. You, so you want the source to be, to be angularly, um, you know, uh, the emittance as, as small as possible. And, and of course you want as many photons as possible coming out. Okay, so <clears throat> that's uh, enough of the source for now. So now let's look at, you know, so I've got a, a beam of photons coming through. Uh, I've got an atom sitting there. Um, I want to introduce something called the, the, the atomic uh, form factor. And um, right away, I introduced the Fourier transform. And after the fact, I realized I actually didn't kind of like motivate it well enough, but just take it, let's take it for granted. I'm going to be using this Fourier transform a lot, at least a couple of times in this uh, presentation. And, um, you know, we'll just take it that the, the, the intensity in reciprocal space is the Fourier transform of the, of the electron density. And so for the atom, where you have all the shells around the, the nucleus at certain distances, you can sort of write out some approximation of what uh, uh, electron density looks like, and then you can Fourier transform it. And that's the, so that's, that's the, sort of like the first scattering you could do, you, this is sort of the, um, you can imagine this being like if you had a gas, that's the scattering you would see. Not very useful, 
Um, let's see, I think my next one is, uh, oh yeah, all right. <clears throat> I should have warned you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have about two or three of these view graphs where I wrote the equations out by hand because it takes too long to work out the, to, to do it on the computer. I'll do that, improve that at some point. But um, let me quickly, so, um, so imagine, um, let's do our first uh, problem, which will have some things in it, which are, you'll see are useful to think about. Um, we're gonna do N atoms in a line, just because it's easy. So, okay, here are these atoms. They've got this, that form factor I was talking about, right? Okay, so how do you um, do, calculate the diffraction from this object? So basically it is the form factor and you can see I have an array of delta functions in there, perfectly spaced by spacing A, right? Which is sort of should remind you of what a, a crystalline lattice looks like. And so I've got the form factor, I'm convolving it with the, the array of delta functions here. So that's the way to write it out mathematically. And that's graphically what it looks like. One atomic form factor decorating many <laughs> delta functions. So, so if you wanna do that, then you know that, okay, well, before you transform the, 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 this, this, um, the, the atomic uh, uh, density, you Fourier transform the array of delta functions, you get another array of delta functions, two pi over a spaced, right? And since it was a convolution there, it becomes a product over there. And so then that allows you to sort of figure out what you expect the intensity to look like, what the diffraction intensity would look like from this 1D array of atoms. It would look like array of delta functions, but the, you can see that the envelope, the intensities of the, um, uh, the, the amplitudes of the uh, delta functions are, are modulated by the, the, um, the form factor of the single, single atom. And that, that's an important concept to keep in mind. And that's the actual gory details down here. If you want, want to look at it. At the end of the day, I want to point out two things. Um, uh, if, if you, at the end of the day, you get something like this. You get a sine and a, over a sine. Where the sine goes to zero is where you get your delta functions. And if you look closely, what you'll see is, okay, the, the peak is the number of atoms you have. So the intensity scales with the number of things in the thing, in the crystal. And then the width of it scales as the size. The, 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 the bigger the crystal is, the narrower the Bragg peak is. Okay, so simple Fourier transform um, equivalency. And you, you'll see that over and over again. And it's an important experimental thing to have. Okay, so that was a, that was a little toy one dimensional line. These are real lattices, right? And there's like a, that they're all known, they're, um, they're crystal, like crystallography textbooks. And so I just wanted to point out, but let's do our second um, kind of slightly more real uh, exp uh, thing. Um, we're almost ready to look at, uh, you know, I'm show you experiments and stuff, but I, we should do this one before. Okay, so this is a sodium chloride. It's a, you know, so the, 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 uh, the gold-like things are the sodium and the green-like things are bigger. The, the chlorine, the, the, the negatively charged, so bigger. And so almost the same thing happens here, except in, a, in this case, you end up doing something like this, that you have, this is a simple example of a, of a lattice. The lattice that's here is the FCC, that's this one, face-centered cubic, okay? And so let's see, if I look at the gold ones, you can see there's one face over there and there's, oops, oh dear. Face into cubic, right? So anyway, it's two, it's two interpenetrating inter FCC lattices. So with that, you can see there's zero, zero, um, there's half zero, there is half O oh, half half or oh, half, that one down there. Anyway, so you can, you can write out where the atoms are in the lattice. Then 
you uh, apply the, what, essentially what we did in the last time. And you, you end up with something like this. And what, what you learn from this, it turns out, so you go through, let, let's say, now, now you're going to try and look at your different Bragg peaks, right? So you look for the 100, and you find that it's a zero. And if you, if you go through, you'll see why it's a zero. I think if you put, if you put a one in one place, you get a minus one in another place and it cancels out. So you, for the 100, the 100 type of uh, Bragg peaks go away. The 111 give you um, the sodium, the sodium structure factor minus the chlorine structure factor. If you look at the two OOs, it's the sodium structure factor plus the chlorine structure factor. So the main message here is that by measuring the intensities of the different Braggs, you, you, you can learn about the, the way the atoms are sitting in the lattice, right? It's, it's, it's okay. Uh, and so and zeros in intensity tell you certain, certain, tells you certain things about the symmetry of lights. And so that's, that's the main message of this, right? So, okay, we'll move on. Okay, so um, a lot of you are familiar with um, Bragg's Law, so Lambda's 2D sine theta, and I'll just really zoom through it in one second. Basically, the main point is if you imagine a photon reflecting from a row of atoms here. Um, okay, you 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 know you get certain reflected amplitude, and if you reflect from the row below it, if you work out what's the phase, what's the extra path length that that ray would have to go. This is not exactly how you're supposed to do it, but it, it's very conceptual. It gives you the right answer. Um, you know, if 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 it if you have this, if this is true, if lambda is 2D sine theta, I mean, if you, then it turns out that the, this reflections from this layer and this layer add in phase. And so if everything adds in phase, you get a strong intensity and that's your Bragg peak. So there is, this is the, the traditional, uh, traditional um, thing. Um, and so, so you can now, now you go into the lab you, you send in your x-ray beam at your sample and you know you rotate your crystal around and you're going to measure some some peaks and um, and then now you know how to figure out um, you know other absences or you know you, you can see the intensities are different so if I took these intensities I could I could probably reconstruct uh, what the structure looks like and it's, it's not it's for a simple thing, of course, it's it's easy, but uh, most things are you need hundreds of peaks to really get a good structure. Okay, and I kind of wanted to make the connection between um, the way one talks about it, and I'm just wondering if I should do that right now. But main point is that everyone talks about um, most beginning classes talk about lambda as two D sine theta, but um, a more useful way to think about it is, um, you know, Q is momentum. The way we learn to think in a more sophisticated way is you think about momentum transfer to the sample. And so if there's your incident beam hitting the sample, uh, a reflected beam going out. So very often people talk about two theta. Well, two theta is this angle, the angle between the beam going straight through and your detector. Okay, that's and if you do the, if you try to figure out what is Q, which is K, Ki minus Kf, this little thing, and the purpose of this view graph was to show that you you end up with the same familiar lambda as 2D sine theta. But but the preferred way to think about it is in terms of Q and Ki minus Kf. That's the preferred way. It makes a good match to reciprocal space. Okay, so. I showed you a powder diffraction pattern a minute ago, and I kind of wanted to, um, uh, to, to, to explain this a tiny bit more. So on the right side, you've got an area detector. It's lying, it's lying down, but uh, it, it would record this image. And so imagine you have, if you went out, you're, you're trying to figure out you know, some some mineral out there which you're hoping will make you rich 
So then you, you, you take it, you grind it up, and you, you bring it to the synchrotron to figure out what structure is it. So because you, you grind it up, you have a whole bunch of little crystals in there, and they're all pointing all these random orientations, right? So you stick it in the beam, and if, if, if you did grind it fine enough, you would see something like this. You know, a whole bunch of rings, and each one is telling you about a particular despacing that's in the crystal. And, you know, that's, this has been, this has been the workhorse. This is, a, you know, um, so essentially this has been crystallography from sort of way back in time. It just gets done much faster and much more efficiently at a synchrotron. And you, you have, you have more, you have like more bells and whistles you can, you can do. And I'll explain a couple of them later on. Anyway, so I, I just did want to make that point to, so that you understand that the, it's, it's the process of, when they call it powder crystallography, it's because it, 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 it makes the data more uniform. And so you basically can take it and, and cut so you integrate nicely. Um, but it, it, you have all these little crystals randomly pointing out and they just, on an average, diffract some light into, you, into your thing. The, the opposite of that is a single crystal, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, <coughs> Let me check the time. Okay, so this is what the, the business end of um, the powder diff the XPD beamline looks like. It's not my beamline, but um, sorry, it's a nice picture. But behind is the area detector. There's a sample. This is a fluorescence detector, so you, you can tell, you know, that you, your sample's in the, in the right place. And then back there, I think it's probably a, a cooler um, to just keep the sample cold. So that's, that's what the, some of the hardware looks like. Oh, I completely forgot to mention one thing. Um, and uh, it comes up here. This, you know, the, 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 the set of view graphs I'm going to show you, and if, there are a few places where you can see I, I wrote, there are other places where I did do some, but I borrowed a lot of the stuff from the, from the website. And I completely forgot to mention that. Um, I'll mention it at the end. So there's a, there's a, just, I'll say it now and I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, make sure I go back to it at the end. Um, there are a lot of UFs in here. They're, they're uh, on our, on the NSLS website, um, we've had a, a sort of a, a bunch of lectures to help people. Um, it's, they, they, they've taught uh, a, a few local colleges, a class on this stuff and they've put them on the website. So, um, people who are interested can go study whichever particular thing it is. And actually in one and a half, I mean, that's a semester class. Essentially I'm trying to teach what's the semester in like an hour and a half or something. So I'm very high gloss over and I borrowed a bunch of the view graphs. You will recognize a lot of them. This is one of them. Um, so this was, this is an example of data that uh, was published from XPD Beamline. There's your powder. They figured out what the structure is. And so then this is just like the, so that's the powder diffraction kind of an experiment. Like I said, it's um, well established. If you, if you have a lab source, you can probably do that kind of work, but it, it gets done a lot better and uh, a lot faster at the synchrotron. The next item I'm going to mention, talk about is not something, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable about, bio, about, about biomaterials. It's not my area at all. I, I, you know, I worked at the Sigatron long enough to know little bits of this thing. And so, um, but I, I figured there may be somebody in the audience who might be a biologist. And so I just wanted to, or was interested in biology. And so I just wanted to, to mention what, what goes on here. So truthfully, um, uh, this is actually not diff almost not different at all from what we just went over in the last few few slides. The only difference is the proteins are very big molecules. You know, there are thousands of atoms. So you, you will get a lattice, but in, instead of having say one or two atoms, I think we had the, in the case of the sodium chloride, I think that was um, four atoms, four atoms of sodium, four atoms of chlorine in the unit cell. And this one, this is like thousands of atoms in the unit cell. And to make matters worse, you know, they're, they're very floppy. They're very, you know, 
very soft materials in some sense. Um, I, I have to say I'm in awe that the, the, these crystallographers are able to solve these structures. Um, it, you know, if you've done a few simple ones, you, you, you have a lot of respect for people who do this kind of work. Um, but they do have some things that help them. So, for example, what, one way these people uh, do their work is they have something called a protein database. And every time somebody solves a structure, they put the, the structure in. And as you know, nature reuses many, many motifs in many different places. And so collectively, I think it, it, it gets easier as they go along. Um, but uh, just to go back, so yeah, so the, the, game, is, the game is simple. Yeah, no, it's not simple, it's <laughs> straightforward. You measure all the intensities that you can of the diffraction pattern. As I said, you measure the intensities, you can reconstruct the molecule that's in the, in the, in the, in the, the, the basis of the, of the lattice. Um, however, these guys also have the, so besides having the, the database and perhaps little bits of the structure already worked out, they also have the DNA sequence that creates molecules. So they know, you know, they know something about um, the linear structure of the protein. Remember, these things get generated as a line and then they refold uh, and, and then they refold on something. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So this one's beta sheets. Um, okay. Okay. And then, and then, but you know, so knowing the DNA is actually not sufficient because what's important is the biological function depends on the photo structure shapes, right? So you actually need to figure out where the structure is. And um, I would say that the, so the, the, let's see, do I, what, what's my next one? Uh, yeah, before I do that, um, this, I think this, the state of the art in this stuff is, you know, I would say like five years ago, it was solving the individual molecules. Now what we're getting a lot of is the drug company people will bring a molecule and then they'll have a drug and then put the two together and see if they can figure out where the thing is, where the drug is binding. Or, you know, they'll have sort of candidate drugs and see how, you know, go through and figure out how they can get things to bind. So it's, it's they've moved up one level of complexity. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is what the, um, the, the bio, one of the bio beam lines looks like. So I will point with my little thingy. This is where the sample sits, right? You can see this round, this thing here positions the sample a little bit. And this one here is a very precise rotation stage because the one critical difference between the, the, powder, the, the powder stuff that we saw in the past where you took um, little individual, you, you take some, some mineral or whatever, you grind it up and you have them randomly diffract at certain cues. You only get certain cues, which is why you get the rings. Here, they, they want to solve the thing as a single, as a single crystal. So that it's in there, it was going to, they try to find one crystal in there and then they rotate that uh, round and try to find all the, all the Bragg peaks in it. So this thing here is a very precise rotation stage. The crystals can be small. I'll show you them in a second. So they've also found out x-rays manage to kill the crystal. So one thing that helps is you've got this cooling thing. It, it, it sends liquid nitrogen, not liquid nitrogen, um, gaseous nitrogen. Right. LN2, um, 70, uh, let's say, actually they run it at 100K. This thing heats it up a little bit, it's 100K. And then the, this big thing down here is a camera, which we will actually see an image that came from that camera. And then the beam comes through this little hole here. And then what we can't see is the, the detector. So let's go to the picture. Ah, so that is, um, so that's all let me set the scale for you. If you look down here, that, those green lines, 100 microns. So this crystal is a tenth of a tenth of a millimeter, and they even work with stuff that's smaller than that. Their beam goes down to like ten microns. Uh, what else did I say here? Oh yeah, and this is actually an exa uh, an example of why you you need to improve the emittance. If if your beam was was had a lot of divergence to it, you know you you wouldn't get as much light onto the sample as, as, you, as you could. So if you, can, if you can shrink the beam, you can get more light on the sample and you can do your experiment better. And that's an example of why making a source with um, uh, low, smaller emittances, in principle going to the diffraction limit, is a better thing. So that was bio. 
and that's what some diffraction single crystal data looks like. So there's the, they, they you know, you, you, you don't let the Dirac beam from the synchrotron hit the detector. Otherwise, I mean, their detectors are a million dollars plus. And uh, so you don't want to kill it. So you put a, a, um, a beam stop in the way so you can see the shadow of the beam stop right there. And there are your little Bragg peaks. And you can see the, the bigger ones means as that they're brighter. So you collect enough of these Bragg peaks, you can solve, the, well, hope, try to solve the crystal structure. So I wanted to say that crystals aren't the only thing in, in matter. You know, you have gases, which are actually not very interesting, but if you, I'll just remind you that form factor calculation, you know, I didn't say we did it, but I showed you how it could be done, um, is, is an example of what you would do for a, um, scattering from a gas, because essentially each individual, even if you had a whole bunch of things there, they're so far from each other, you, you, it's just like a, a, a random sum of independent you know, atoms. So that's what a, a gas would look like. Then we have fluids. And I had, did actually mean to um, do a fluid calculation, but I ended up not having enough time for it. Uh, so I kind of, so main point is even solids, you have, you know, you have 3D crystals, which we've already looked at, those are sodium chloride. You have 2D crystals, which we're gonna do in a second. And I just wanted to point out, um, there are 1D crystals, but, but those are actually um, spin chains, for example, and uh, they end up, because of spin, um, people would use, more likely use um, neutrons to look at that. Although we can do some magnetic stuff, and I will mention something about that later. Uh, so, oh, right, and there's even uh, liquid crystals, uh, which is sort of um, partial, uh, sort of a maybe a fluid, um, a fluid, uh, it's ordered in one direction and fluid, fluid in another. And, you know, you can look up, you can look that up if you want. Okay, so here's my surfaces. And uh, I hope it's clear. <laughs> Let me know. Um, so, uh, imagine we have, so, so it turns out the synchrotrons are bright enough that we can actually look, look at surfaces and mo monolayers. And, and so here's an example. So I'm just doing a, a toy experiment for what you would expect from a scattering from a surface. So here's a, I didn't have the time to color in all the little dots, but you can imagine all these dots in this lattice here, right? And again, here's my uh, density. It's, I have a, a delta function in Z uh, because I want it to be a, a surface. And then there's my periodic array in X and Y. And I apply my, you know, Fourier transform. They're Fourier transforming that. And you go through it. And what, what you end up with is, so you, you get, it's periodic in X and Y. So you do Fourier transform, you're gonna get periodic in X and Y, right? Um, in, in H and K, shall we say, in reciprocal space. But because it's very thin in Z, what you will see is you have these long rods in reciprocal space. They don't go on forever because at the end of the day, in this calculation, because I'm using a delta function, they go on forever. But if you remember, if it's, if it's an atom decorating each one, the intensity will drop off as the form factor of the individual atoms in that layer. But but com comparatively speaking, you can, you can see it's very long in one direction and it's ordered in the other. And that's what a characteristic for a surface. And in fact, I can, I've, I've measured things like that at the BMI. Um, I was gonna add something. So that's one way to get to it. And I just wanna point out the other way to get to it, just also conceptual. If, if you remember earlier on, I, I, sh I said if you if you had the extent of the uh, the crystal, you know the, the width of the the width of the feature in reciprocal space uh, went as uh, one over the size of the crystal. So if you imagine starting with a square box, and you squeeze the square box flat till you get to um, a, a thin sheet, you can imagine that you're going to see exactly the same result. That you get rods uh, perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so that was surfaces. And so that kind of brings us to reflectivity. 
And this is a, so a lot of, a lot of, um, a, a lot of materials that, that people bring are thin films on something else because that's a very common uh, growing, you know, you, you know, you, you start out with a silicon wafer or something and you grow something on top of it and you want to know how, how good it is, how thick it is, how smooth it is. And let's see. So, um, let's see how, how I can do this is, uh, so it, again, Ki on the substrate. In this case, we're going, for now, we're going to view this. We're not, you know, yes, there are atoms in there, but we're going to view it as jelly. It's basically sort of a bag of electrons, right? So um, here comes an incident Ki. And I think, as I mentioned, the, um, the refractive index in the material is slightly less than one. And so what will happen is K here will be a certain length. In the material, K is going to be slightly shorter. And so when you work, do the sort of the simple, you know, ref, um, you can do it from uh, Maxwell's equations or you can just, you can do other, other approaches. If you, if you say, let's say for example, if you match phase, right? You'll end up with a critical angle. You'll end up with an angle below which um, the beam is perfectly reflected. Okay, so, so uh, okay, so that's that's a critical angle, and so, so the yeah, I'll just I'll just let it go. There is an analogy with uh, being in the pond, looking up from the bottom. It's the other way around. Um, what else do I want to add here? So anyway, like I said, you get perfect reflectivity below the critical angle. And if you work out um, parental reflectivity equations from that, you have something like this. Um, it, 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 limit, it ends up limiting like that. And this is what it looks like. You have, I should have marked right there would be the critical angle. And you can see it drops as one of the Q squared uh, up to the, the critical angle. And then it's one below the critical angle. It's perfectly reflected below that. And actually, by the way, we use that for we use that for our mirrors, right? So for for when, when we're doing mirror design for for beamline, you have to be below the critical angle to to have your mirror be a useful a useful optical feature. Okay, so well, um, actually, measuring the critical angle is nice. It tells you something about the material, but actually, it's you can get that. Um, in other ways, it's not as accurate, but it, it's important to know it's there. But more often, what people measure is um, if, you, if you have material A and material B, you're going to get fringes which depend on the thickness. And so here it is, uh, it's two pi of the delta Q. So there's delta Q, so you, you apply this function of delta Q. And then the distance between these two things tells you something about tells you how thick the how thick the film is, and so that's sort of the quick and dirty approach. Um, the the more how do I say? You put more work in, you get more out, and more work in is is this, and actually this is nothing more than the the Fourier transform, except um, it's it's with a derivative. Um, it's with a derivative. And how do I say it? You, you have the density. You do the derivative. If you do the derivative, let's see if I have another. Uh, no, I don't. Um, anyway, it's simpler to model that way. Every time you go through a step. Okay, maybe here's how to think about it. So. If you're doing a derivative of the material, you would get zero until you get to this edge. You would get a value for the derivative across the first bound interface. Then you get another derivative from the green to the outside. Right? I don't know if that makes any sense. But you basically you get two, two, two places where the derivative changes, there and there. And then those, the interference of those two points where the derivative of the density changes, which is really what that is, ends up giving you 
the, the fringes over here, right? So, and then, and then with this approach, you can probably throw in things like the roughness of the material, is the top surface rougher than the bottom? So that's the other thing you can pick up from this. So this is reflectivity, a, another, um, another kind of experiment that a lot of people come to do. SACs and GSACs. So, um, so um, small angle X-ray scattering. So I would say it's at the end of the day, everything is a Fourier transform of the of, of the um, of the electron density. But sometimes um, you can optimize for one kind of an experiment or another. And there's a class of experiments where um, let's suppose you're looking for looking at objects that are on sort of the nanometer scale, say, for example, um, long wavelength. In fact, um, they, they, they are so good, they can, they can do things up to the micron scale. So there are some experimental configurations that are so optimized, you can see the same thing with visible light as you can with the x-rays, which is quite a feat, and it's good. And anyway. Um, so the main thing is you optimize to look at uh, small angles. Um, there's, there's a sample X-ray beam, you've got your area detector. And then what you do is, so this, this is your intensity as a function of, uh, that's the center of it, that is going out in Q. You, you flip it around, you can see they, um, they apply a transform to, to do that. And then from this, you can then make it a one dimensional Right, it's 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 how do I say it's sp not spherically, it's uh, it's circularly symmetric. So to to get the most um, what do you call it signal to noise, you basically try to take as much of the data as, data as you can as possible, and so you collect it all and then swing it around into Q, and then then you can do some some um, different uh, analysis to it. Uh, let's see, elastic scattering, some angles. Yep, yep, okay. So I covered all that. And so here's an example. Um, supposing you had uh, a, a suspension and inside a little, um, maybe quantum dots, right, of a certain size. And you kind of hope they're all the same size. So it turns out, you know, um, so you, go, you, you stick it into the beam and you get, I guess, would be the red dots. And so then from now, you go do the Fourier transform of a, of a hard sphere. And that's what you get. And by the way, there are, you can do the various Fourier transforms of different things. I make sure you want more. And he even does it here. Um, so you, you take that function and then you try to fit it to your to your structure and then you can extract what's the average size of this of the those spheres in your in your fluid and this ends up being this is getting increasingly used in structural biology actually um, not the one of the beam lines so on one hand they'll have this floppy stuff and they'll try to do the diffraction from it but then they'll bring it over to the sax beam line and they'll try and get the overall outside shape of the molecule. And um, anyway, so that's an example of SACS. Uh, okay, I'll move on. And, you know, th there's, um, I just wanted to point out that it's, uh, um, the, the, it's the, the, the truth is the SACS uh, analysis looks pretty complicated. But there are a few simple things you can do. And so one of the things that you can do sort of reasonably robustly is figure out the radius of gyration of some, some object. You may, you may have a tough time figuring out, say, see, for example, over here, here's a Q. And um, here are different shapes. If the thing's a sphere, this is how it's falling off with Q. If it's a disk, you can see that's a different fall off. And if it's a rod, it's a different fall off, right? So while it might be hard to distinguish um, which, which specific one you have, because they're like randomly oriented in space and all of that, 
one thing you can do is reasonably robustly determine the radius of gyration um, from, from, from your data. And this explains how to do it. So that, you know, if that's something of interest, this is uh, SACS is one thing to try. Um, something that's also getting a lot of attention is um, grazing incidence SACS. And so um, in, in that, in that uh, case, you, you, you combine, if you recall, a few graphs back, I mentioned you come along at the critical angle and you get the beam is perfectly reflected, right? So that ends up, the, the advantage of that is you end up minimizing background because the beam doesn't go inside the sample. So you end up just scattering from the top surface of your material. And if you have nanoparticles or something uh, on top, you can, again, figure out the shape on how they are packed. In this, in this case, because you can see, you can see that there's, there's ordering. You can see in, in some of the previous ones where we're doing, we were doing radius of gyration, for example, the, you, have to, you, you have to try to set the experiment so that each molecule is independent. There's nothing else close to it. You have a set of independent things. In this case, you're getting more like the crystalline lattice where there's stuff around it and there's some periodicity in the material. And you can see that with the spacing here. And in fact, you can see that it's a couple of layers thick because you've got some, some extra features in this direction. So, um, so anyway, GSACS is another um, experimental approach people seem to enjoy and uh, get something useful out of. Where are we now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, I'll, I'll confess um, that uh, I'm more from the diffraction side. And so, of course, I went right first into uh, diffraction and Fourier transforms and all that. But I did mention at the beginning that, you know, one of the advantages of working on synotrons, you've got all the different uh, energies to play with. And so I want to say a few words about um, some of the spectroscopic uh, techniques that people work with as a synchrotron. And uh, there's X-ray absorption spectroscopy and fluorescence. Um, and there's even this XS, I guess I missed to put, put that on here. So, all right. So you've got, you've got your material, you know, it's got sort of a, a, a let's say, let's say copper again, it's got the, um, and I, I send in photons that have a higher energy. So there's the uh, K edge, and that, that's vacuum, it's free to, free to propagate. I, I send in a photon that's high enough to pop out this electron from that core level. Okay, so what happens? So by the way, if, if my energy is lower than that, it, it doesn't come, there's, it, it doesn't get ejected, right? If it's higher than that, I can eject the, uh, the electron. And then there are two paths forward. One, you can get an X-ray out. And what happens is if you kick that one out, um, something comes down and then you get a, a, an, an X-ray, a characteristic energy of photon that gets emitted as this electron pops down. And so that is one, there are, different ways to use that, but a very simple way to use it is that's telling you when you see photons of that, you, know, you hit it with a prompt that's higher, um, you, you get this characteristic energy and you know that element is in that material you're looking at. So that's one thing. <clears throat> Another, so that's one path, you, you, you kick out, the second path is you kick out an electron and you get an Auger electron coming out thing pops down, the, there's an electron that comes out. Um, the people who do spectroscopy, spectroscopy use both, both channels to, for different reasons. Um, so, uh, all right. Oh, right, so here's an example of using, um, using the fluorescent signal. So, I think actually this was, you know, I, I took this from the SRX beamline, but I think it looks like this was actually done at Slack. 
but it doesn't matter. It makes the main point. So scanning closer microscopy is what the SRX beam line does. Essentially what you do is you get your source. It turns out even though our sources are bright, you still need to refocus the light. So they have an optic that refocuses on the sample. And then you have a detector that's looking at the fluorescence. And in fact, they, they, they measure all, basically all the web wavelengths, uh, as, as, as many as the detector will allow them, as, you know, as much of a wavelength spectrum as the, the detector will allow them to do. And then you scan through your samples. So here, um, I think it is a root of some, uh, root of some plant, and they know that some elements get you know, encapsulated in the root and some, some don't. So they're looking to see where the different elements stop. And um, so you've got a, this is an optical microscope picture of the, of the material with all the different places in this thing. And then you do a scan. So here's potassium, uh, I don't believe that. And then let's see, mm, there's iron, arsenic five. And I'm not sure what, I don't see what this is because it's not, I'm not sure what this is. But now, the, the main point is, I just wanted to make that point, which is you can, you can find where elements are in your sample. And so you can see this is an, an, an interesting application of uh, fluorescence microscopy. So it's sulfur iron, oh, and two different arsenic species, okay. All right, oh, there it is, sulfur. There you go. I couldn't find that. All right. So that that's one kind of an in sort of a spectroscopic application. Um, so now I just want to do excess in a very. I'm doing everything in a very superficial way, um, and I'm simply pointing out what's available, and you can you can pursue those paths to to learn more about something. So in this case, XAFs is, uh, I think I have another view graph in the next one. Let me just double check before, right, right. Hmm. Yes, okay. Okay, so, so there's, uh, my, this picture requires a little bit of explanation. So imagine I'm sitting here, two atoms, right? Yeah, this is like the, the potential. And uh, so um, and we're identifying this atom as the absorbing atom. So x-rays come in, pop out an, elect uh, pop out an electron. And what happens, so you can see if, depending on the energy with which I came in, the, the electron that comes out is going to have a different, different kinetic energy. And, and so that's, that's what's illustrated here. So it's basically it's energy is this axis here. Um, so to do, the, to do the, the, what is it called? To do the amplitude of that, the, the sort of the, what the cross section is going to be, you have to, end, you end up having to include the probability that the electron scatters off the, the other nearby atoms and it gets it gets included in the total phase and so what will happen is you will see the the cross section change wh whether you sort of have like resonances with the nearest nearest neighbor atoms so you will see you know so again this is signal as you're going up you get nothing until you hit the um, you hit the binding energy and you start to see oscillations around uh, around the intensity and then it sort of flattens out. And th these oscillations are due to the interference and, and you have to do this with the total calculation of the electron coming out. Um, that's the essence of XS. And let's see, so let's see on the next page, Right, so if you look at these two panels down here, take those oscillations that you saw on the top of that, isolate them, and then take their Fourier transform. 
And it turns out it does a pretty good job of telling you the things, information about the atoms near the next nearest neighbors of this of, of the, the, the atom that emitted the electron that, that got popped out. So, you know, you get the first, uh, th there are different ones, there are different ones here, but you can see there's like first shell, second shell, third shell. And I, I, I know that they can tell, you know, it takes a lot of analysis, but they can do things like see how many nearest neighbors are there. Um, you know, and then if they have a, a mixed system, sometimes they can tell um, which Z is nearest, which kind of atom is nearest neighbor. I and mean, it does often requires extra information. But anyway, the point is that if you have a material that's completely, completely amorphous, it's not a single crystal, you can do an x axis experiment and you can learn something about what's right next to um, your atom that you fluoresced. You know, let's, suppose, let's say it's iron. You can see in the vicinity of the iron, what, what, what's, what's the, the structure. It's an art in the analysis. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I can't do it. Um, so, um, and then the other thing, I, the simple thing I wanted to point out is that um, depending on the um, specific uh, element, um, you know, so you, you have some elements which have different oxidation numbers, right? You know, different, um, and, and it turns out it has an effect on the nearest on, on the, the specific value of the edge, right? So I think, okay, that's zero, and then what's red? That's two plus. And so that's another thing they can tell. They, they, you know, they can go to a particular element in the structure and they can find out what's its valence state. Uh, so that's another kind of useful thing that you can do with a spectroscopy. Okay. Yeah, this, so anyway, the main point is that that's x apps and oh, I think I already I already mentioned this. Okay, so that's tomography and simple uh, TXM work. So you can think of this thing here. So this is okay. I'll just step through it quickly. It's um, so first of all, you you you, you shine light on a sample. So there's the there's the mirror that you know bends the beam onto the sample. And then you have this um, high resolution lens, right? And then you have a detector. And so this, this allows you to take essentially X-ray images. If you wanna think about it, um, this is like the optical microscope, this part here. This is like the, the lens that is right next to the sample when, when, you, when you're looking under a microscope. And this thing over here is like your eye except it goes through a computer and then you can look at it on the screen. And then this, this thing here is like the light on the bottom of the, on this, on the bottom of the sample when you're looking at it. So this is like a, what we call a full field um, imaging thing. And then the, the other thing you can add to this, and this is um, stand, standard now, is the, you can see it has a little rotating thing there and you do tomography. So you don't just take one image you take a bunch of images and you just generate a 3D picture. So that's another kind of experiment that we have um, on, on the floor. And I think that's it actually, hmm, 11.40. So before I forget, I promised that I would go back and show the first thing home. Okay, good. Yeah, here, um, so what I did was um, for, this, for this talk, you know, the, the, this set of lectures exists, and they're, they're very nice lectures. But I, I wanted, to, I wanted to have a slightly different path, so I cut out section. I cut out a lot of images you'll recognize, and I filled it in to, to give a different walk through the material. But um, I, I really should acknowledge uh, it takes a lot of time to get um, uh, nice PowerPoints. And so I really want to acknowledge th this collection. And I think all the synchrotrons have um, something like that. So even if you don't want to come to BNLs, I think, uh, I think most, most other facilities have something like that sort of a collection to help users uh, learn, learn what they to do. So like I said, this 
this talk um, was more about um, hopefully um, experimental uh, capabilities that someone out there might want to use and a little bit of background to help them figure out what and if they wanted to use it. And in the next one, I'll be talking more about the ring and the beam line and then any things which I, I, I found I, or I forgot in, or didn't get enough time to get to on this one. So I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you very much, and it was very, very instructive and very clear. And as you said, it's difficult in one hour and a half uh, to get some, uh, some complete explanation as well uh, from right. your expertise. So it's very ambitious what you did. And at least it will be twice one hour and a half. So right. it has some potential, let's say. Right. I, I think mostly my, I felt like my job was just to point you to what you, maybe where you want to go. That was really my, my job, just to point the direction. Not so much to teach you everything, but just to point the direction. And indeed, so this is really good to have as well all those different methods and technology. And then if there are some specific uh, methods that some of uh, so our uh, audience or our lecture, our um, students would like to understand. So it's also by having well, the possibility to revisit uh, as well this uh, preparation or to as well contact you, I guess, that this is uh, very, very interesting in any case for me as well from the neutron side. So it's uh, complementary. So okay, I didn't that's know. Right. Technique. I, I, I did mention it, right? Yes, the right? neutron can be complementary for the spin, indeed. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it was, um, and in fact, in going through that, there was a, like a, a, a one view graph, which I saw, I, it was, it made it very clear that that difference between the two techniques, but it wasn't relevant to this one. And it, it was one view graph where uh, someone had, for large Q, they, they showed sort of powder diffraction data from some material where, where the x-rays um, would, would, because of the form factor, would die out. But for the neutrons, because the neutron uh, form factor is so, um, you, the diffraction peaks went forever. So, you know, you're not limited by the atomic form factor. Your, your neutron form factor is very small in physical space, so it's very big. Space. Exactly. And, and this is why it will be interesting as well. And we'll have as well some courses uh, from the neutron side a bit later on, so in November. So very interesting and complementary. So excellent. So do we have any questions so, from our students? So I guess that some of you have as well worked uh, with light source or with, uh, of course, similar scattering technique. So do we have any questions? Hello? Yes. Yes, uh, um, can you guys hear me? Go ahead. Uh, Kenneth, I wanted to ask you, I once did a, a, a graduate course, uh, an online graduate course regarding the synchrotron and the neutron scattering. I'm currently interested in uh, coarser nanoparticles, basically magnetic coarser nanoparticles. Basically, I am a fab I'm usually working, fabricate, synthesizing. Uh, core shells with multiple shells. So can the characterization be done also in those type of uh, magnetic nanoparticles? Yeah, actually it gives me a chance to um, mention some, uh, there was someone who was on the line earlier on and she was talking about the magnetic stuff. Um, I didn't say anything at all about magnetic in this talk, um, but we actually, I actually work at a beam line, which is, um, it's kind of half of its job is dedicated to magnetic uh, scattering. It has um, polarization uh, capability. And so it can study, you know, I mean, with x-rays, it's never as good um, a, 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 a magnetic scatterer as neutrons are. But nevertheless, you know, it's some, it could be tried. So for your, for your material, you know, Normally, you have an, um, sort of a, a physical structure, right? So you have an, sort of an electronic structure. And then yeah. the, the magnetic structure is a sort of, let's say, maybe twice the unit cell or something like that. Uh, so we can guarantee you can look at your materials, um, sort of the, the, the structure, 
the magnetic structure is pop we, until you try the experiment, you don't know. So, oh, okay. and it depends on what exactly you want to measure in the magnetic properties that, uh, yeah. So, so we can, we can tell you stuff about the material, right? Like, you know, now you said you called it a core shell. So I'm assuming something like nanoparticles or something. Yeah, it's nanoparticles, basically with multiple uh, shells. Right. So I'm working on that, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, actually, so that doesn't sound too bad. Okay, which is, you know, when you say, so, if, let's assume first order, it's round, right? So the first yeah. order experiment is um, essentially what's the size? You saw an example where someone had a, a solid round particle. You can sort of even see what's the size of your particle. But now I have to ask, what, what about the magnetism? What, what direction? Is it pointing radially or... Um, is it, uh, what, how is that behaving compared to the, compared to the material? Essentially what I'm asking is, is there, you know, if, if you imagine a regular lattice, right? So yeah. in the regular lattice, you would have, let's say some structure, some unit cell, and then maybe your spins would flip one way and flip the other way, and it would change the size of the unit cell. So you would look in a particular place in reciprocal space, for your magnetic peaks, right? You, you, okay. you, right. So in, in your core shell thing, is, is there... Um, so... Uh, what, what, what's the magnetism doing? And where would I be looking okay. for a signal from, from the magnetism in your thing? Okay, so basically my stru structure is that I have a, I have a core, a uh, core will be a non-magnetic material, and now, and the shell is going to be a magnetic uh, mm -hmm. material, just like iron. Right. And it's going to be pointing, and it's going to spin. It's going to be pointing in the in the in the center, which is the the non-magnetic uh, material. So it's radio. So, yes. Everything is it's radio. Yes. Radio. Yes. I have to think about this. Oh, okay. I, I I'm not sure. I, um, I mean, I I I, I think. I think the answer is going to be, you know, if, if you, if, so with a shell, right? So uh, the shell is going to have a particular Fourier transform. And it's going to be slightly different from where the core is, right? The, right, so the, the periodicity yeah. is going to be slightly different. And so it seems to me that if you look in the right, if you figure out where the shell scattering is maximized, um, you might you might be able to get some magnetic signal, and it's just that it, it's going to be weak. But but I, I think I think you have to do something. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so, so that, that's 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 your homework. Calculate okay. <laughs> calculate the, the the electron scattering from the from the core. Calculate the okay. scattering from a shell. Right, and, and then sort of see where they end up in reciprocal space. And the, the thing about magnetic scattering is it's, um, it goes as like one over, it's like a hundred times weaker than, than electron scattering, right? Uh, and so yeah. you'll have to decide if you think that, you know, if for example, your, your charge scattering goes close to zero, then you have a chance. If, if, it's, if it's same level, maybe you don't have a chance. Oh, okay, okay. Your magnetic scattering is always about a hundred times less strong than. So, in order to do this, I mean, this is my last question. In order mm. to do this characterization, mm. how small or how big the sample? Is? What's the maximum size of the of your sample? Uh, what size should it be? Is it okay if it's in solution also? Or? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So, okay, maybe it's a good time for me to mention that um, uh, with these synchrotrons, you apply to beam time. So basically, you look on their website, all, okay. any, any one of them, you figure out how to write a, a, a proposal. They, they sort of give you a little bit of a guidance. Um, obviously, you can talk to me and I can also, actually, so um, I'm not the magnetic expert. My, my boss is the magnetic expert. And um, so I would steer this her direction, but I can certainly do that. I can help you with writing proposal and, um, you know, 
I, I know I know some things to help help the proposal um, look better or something. So okay, yeah. Okay, okay. But but we would you would have to do those calculations first, right? So that okay. to convince, in fact, it would be part of the proposal just to convince the person that you could see something. Okay. Yeah, because I've been, I've been doing a few simulations on this on on on, but but it wasn't it wasn't the scattering. It was just the temperature and the magnetization. Mm -hmm. So now, since you gave me that idea, I will mm -hmm. do a few simulations on the magnetic scattering and mm -hmm. yeah. and. Is is there a temperature where your your thing goes magnetic? Is there a mercury temperature type type of thing? So for for the for the example that I'm talking about, the Curie temperature it was around six. I mean, it was around three hundred to three hundred and forty Kelvin. Okay. So yeah, we have a we have temperature control. For, okay. Yeah. So we can we can go colder. Okay. Okay. All right. Think about it. Okay, I'll think about it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, will I get your email here or? Yeah, it's somewhere. Or just it's on the website. agenda page. Okay, uh, okay. You, you know okay. the Indico agenda page? So oh, yeah, okay. This email address is there. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, bro. Okay, so you have some proposal now that will come. Excellent. <laughs> oh, interesting. You see, this is exactly what drives this capacity. So it's wonderful. And a good proposal because it's oriented as well, if you can help with that. Because I guess that then there's a lot of other proposals as well. So what's the right. probability? I mean, how many proposals do you have? Well, it depends as well on the beam line that you have available. Well, the thing is, if, it's, if, it's, if the proposal is written well and it, you know, the, you know, our beam line does magnetic, you know, like I should not me, but my boss does magnetic stuff. That's her main thing. And so if she gets a proposal that's something magnetic and it's done well, you know, you know, she would be, oh, yeah. So, it's, so I, 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 don't, I don't think, so I, I'm not, I don't think the right question is, the right question is not what's the probability, is really how nice is your proposal? Yeah. That's the thing, right. Very good. So you see, you have some uh, sense, huh? Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Very good. So, so Sandy, that was really nice to, to hear that. So do we have any other um, person who would like to, to speak out, whether from the experience or as well, if they have specific questions? Christine, there's a question on the chat. Uh, do we? Uh, yes, I see. Some, uh, so do, do you want to speak out, um, uh, Himam, or do you want that uh, I ask about? Uh, uh, let, let me see if I can find it. Is it, is it okay. This is about the electrical property of the nano shell that you mentioned in the slide 27. Okay, slide 27. Okay, let me mm -hmm. see if I can figure out where that is. Uh, right, okay, so let me look at slide 27. Wait, Maybe I'll, you can I'll, share. I'll, you can reshare. I'll share it again. Yeah, I'll yeah. share it again. Just a minute. Because because I I, I sort of copied view graphs. Some of the old numbers are on, so I'm not sure. Um. So let me see if I can, mm, yeah, 27, okay. So according to the slide thingy, so this is 27. So I, I'm sure that's not what the person was asking about. And, and if you look sometimes when I copy the view graph, you can see there's a number down there. I think that may be what the person was looking at. So maybe Amat, can you? Can they ask the question again? Amat, can you 
picture more or less where uh, around which time beginning or end of the presentation it was mentioned those uh, nano shell huh? yeah well, could it be for the the, the bio so if but but there's you know these are these are there's no conductivity in beta sheets so this well. is, of course yeah 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 so i, I yeah i'm just thinking about shell yeah but it doesn't does it, is there a 27 oh. in Or maybe we can we can look yeah for for next time as well because yeah. we have a bit of time so that we can really get as well from uh, from okay. Islam Hammer. So if if you can write it down maybe to try to to help us to guide where it would be. Yeah. And then next time we can come back to that. Huh? Right. The slide. You, so you will send us uh, your slides, of course. I will. I will send it. Mm -hmm. I will uh, look through and make sure I didn't make any mistakes, yeah. and I'll send it. Um, any other questions? Let's see. From the user to everyone. So, who, so who is the user? Could we have the person's name, please? Because we, we keep attendance and we're going to give a, a certificate of participation at the end of the lecture series. So, we need to know the people's name. Um, can the person who is the user either write the, write the name or speak up so we know who this person is? Please. Uh, hello, everybody. Yes. Okay, I'm Abdul Kadri Diallo from Senegal. I have uh, just, uh, I think, one question for the prof. Uh, can we use the same proton source for HRV uh, for organic uh, materials, synthetic organic materials? I'm sorry, which type of organic materials? Uh, for I, I it, oh yeah, yeah. Because on your presentation you talk about yeah. solids and uh, powders, but I don't see where we talk about uh, thin films. So oh. sometimes I work with uh, thin films, but I yeah. uh, for the the look um, the origin diffractor matters. Mm -hmm. We have no signals, but sometimes I see it, uh, sometimes I see we use synchrotron. But yeah. I, I think if we use it, is it not possible to destroy the, the quality of uh, the films with the beam lines? Well, uh, okay. <clears throat> it is true that. Um, some beam lines can be very powerful, uh, and so some materials can be destroyed. But I think the trick is to make sure you do your experiments in an efficient way. So, for example, the way the biology people handle their their data is, I mean, they they for. For example, basically, they basically try to take the data quickly before the sample is destroyed, right? Because the the beam is powerful enough to, you know, it 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 uh, it, it kills. It, it actually it turns out it kills in a systematic way. It kills the sulfur atoms first. There are certain there are certain atoms in the structure where the bonds are broken first. So it's not everything gets killed. But what, what they do notice is that the quality of the crystal, the diffraction data decreases with the function of time. Now, what, what is the material that you, you, you are having a thin film? Because, I, and by the way, I did put something of thin films in there. But, but first of all, let's start with your material. What, what is your material? Approximately, not, not exactly. It's uh, or, 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 organic uh, semiconductor, sir. Organic semiconductor. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how thick is it? How, how thick are these films that you, you care about? I don't, I do not understand the, I don't um, I'm assuming that you, you coat a thin organic film. Yeah. On, on something, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Do you have a sense how thick the film is? If I have. Hmm. 
Well, so let me let me let me point out to you. Let me just go back to the talk because um, I can show you where. Um, where is it? Mm -hmm, I think this is it. So I would recommend that. So first of all, <clears throat> you know, this is almost like the first measurement you would make on a film, right? Which is, you know, you'd look and see how thick is the film, how smooth is the surface. Yeah. Then the next ex experiment I, I would recommend for, for your material is something like this, right? Where, um, so if it's an organic semiconductor, it's probably um, it's, it's probably got some crystal structure in the material, right? And so you can see you can you can see which um, you can see there's there's some crystallinity in this film that was put on this material. So what what what's the what's the substrate on which this is put? Uh, sometimes you use uh, silicon or uh, glass. Okay, I would recommend the silicon. Yeah. Um, put put it on silicon because um, it is a cleaner background, and your organic films have some disorder in them, and you know then it becomes and the glass always has disorder, right? So then you you're competing between the disorder of your film and the disorder of the glass. So I'd put it on a single crystal substrate. Uh, and um, and then yes, you can do this kind of a measurement, GSAX kind of a measurement, reflectivity kind of measurement. Um, and I would recommend that you you, you set up to, to to try to be efficient in the measurement process, so that you get the data you need before. Actually, one of the things in the experiment is to figure out does the beam destroy the sample. It's, it's one of the things you would do, which is just put the beam on and see how the, how the structure is changing with time. And that will give you a sense of how much time you have with which to take the data, right? So you, you try, and then if, if, then if you've, you've hit the point where the sample's destroyed, you have to put a new one in if you didn't get the piece of data you wanted, you know, so. Okay, thank you. That's my recommendation. Yeah, very nice recommendation. So any more questions uh, or comments? Uh, so maybe from uh, um, Kamini, so as a newcomer as well, that would be interesting nope. to see and compare. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. You're speaking. Thanks a lot, uh, Kenneth, uh, for, for this lecture. Uh, yeah. I, I want to ask, so it turns out that the only continent we do not have um, a light source is Africa. Um, and so really doing, um, really doing this type of um, experiments or something could be difficult. So, so uh, me, I just concluded my undergrad and, and it turns out that most of what we can do, we can do it, um, through DFT-based methods or, or, sorry, or calculating through, something from many body perturbation theory. Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. Computational Most modeling. Ah, uh, computational modeling, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we can, we can do this through computational modeling from right. the functional theory codes right. Right. Or, or really studying the, um, the, the band gaps of the of semiconductor materials from from many body perturbation theory codes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, so the, my question on, on trouble has been that um, if, if we want to look at ARPES, ARPES um, mm. um, uh, using ARPES to like sort of detect the uh, properties of materials, I think mm -hmm. which is something I'm recently uh, looking at some um, uh, uh, high temperatures yeah, uh, yeah. There is there is a little bit of issue which um, I've been thinking of. Um, if 
uppers actually can give us um, uh, the magnetism somehow in material. So, so if we have like um, like some sort of magnetic material, and we want to like resolve the Fermi surface of the material, um, which I think in the system I am trying to study um, because because really the they are different things about the material from uh, different experiments which is totally not clear and I, and I want to look at this. Um, looking at magnetism somehow, um, is it possible does APES in any way uh, detect the, the spin, uh, minority spin around the, the, the band gaps of the Fermi surface? Uh, uh, yeah, if if one has to calculate this, uh, does it in any way do this? Uh, yeah, and, okay. and also, um, okay. well, because, I'll yeah. tell you what I, I can do. Uh, I'll tell you what I can do. I have a friend, okay. who who an Italian friend who works at the Synchrotron. He does APES for a living, so I'll go and talk to him during this week, and I'll get myself up to date on on what's you know what's possible. My my. You know, my sense is that from the work I've seen them do and work I've kind of read a little bit of, they, they do actually do the band structure. They do, they can see the spin splitting in the materials. Um, I don't know, I don't know if, um, you know, to what extent they detect magnetism in the materials, but certainly they, 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 they do see a spin splitting. Um, you know, <coughs> different um, band edges with different spin, whatever. So I know, I know mm. that's, that's possible. So I'll, I'll go and find, kind of educate myself a little bit and come back to you. And, and maybe send me yeah. a, yes. a, more written, a more written question that you, you want answered. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. You, you um, think... Just the last thing to just uh -huh. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, just the last thing to just add uh, also mm -hmm. to think about uh, uh, the Van Hoff singularities just in a material just around the Fermi surface. I don't know uh, because I know when I do DFT calculation, I can, I can estimate that from, from the occupation at, uh, beside the first Fermi level, but, but I'm trying really to see how I can see that also from upper uh, experiments or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, I know that um, uh, those are the issues that I, I see them uh, trying to address at the beam line. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, an, it's a production, right? It's, you know, to, 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 to do an office experiment is, you have you sort of have to first of all learn how to do it with it, it, you don't go to the beam line for that kind of experiment um I, I'll, ha I'll have to check the, you know you have to have the right software and i think the way they run the beam line <coughs> the, the groups that come in they have it you know the, the you know <coughs> the professor is an expert in it and then they have a tradition and they have their own software and they come and they take the data and they <coughs> map out the band structure um, and, and they know the materials in advance. Um, so mm. it's, 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 I mean, may, maybe if, um, my guess is that it would be, since you probably don't have a background in this, in the experimental side, I would say that you might want to join yes, that. one of those teams and start to learn. Uh, this stuff. So, but anyway, let, let me let me talk to him. First of all, send me a written version of your question, and I will okay. chat, chat with him and bring myself up to date, and try and come back and answer to you on uh, okay. next week or later. But next, I'll try and I'll try okay. to next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kenneth. Um, also, just before I leave, I. Do you think it's possible uh, that we will get uh, uh, exodus someday in Africa? 
maybe yeah, there are people who are, work, there are people like, who are working on, i'm sorry I, I, I was yeah, going to say that I said something like they sent me. There are there are people who are working on it. I I I, I worked on it a couple of years ago. Got got dispirited, um, uh, but people are working on it, and um, it'll happen one day. But for you personally, I would advise not waiting for that to happen. Uh, you know there mm. are the synchrotrons around. Um, you can apply for beam time, you know, yeah. you have to have a good experiment in mind. You apply for mm. beam time, take mm. advantage of the sources that exist now. Uh, you know, you travel, yeah. you do your measurements and you come back and yeah, yes, one fine day. And basically along the way you improve your skills and one fine day, maybe mm. Africa will get the synchrotron. You know? So, so uh, okay. it's a, uh, it's a, uh, mm. Uh, Lawrence still connected. Maybe he can comment on the African light source uh, development. Yep. Yep. Uh, except that I don't maybe, see him. Maybe he's multitasking. Yeah, he is multitasking. <laughs> so, so, but this is this is a sort of very good point indeed uh, to try to see for the future and for the yeah. characterization actually at the African light source. So it would be as well a very nice. Uh, uh, correct um, understanding what would be potentially added value to the existing light source as well. So right. it's as well really interesting to yeah develop some knowledge there right. and then to bring this capacity in Africa. So so we really look forward for that. And so yeah, please uh, follow up as well. Uh, you you know sort uh, whether for your PhD after or before to what is ongoing with the African light source. And we have uh, so Lawrence Lawrence Norris who is really as well deeply involved in that. So there is a website uh, that uh, where you can follow a lot of the ongoing events. And actually, in November, there's going to be as well an, an event in Rwanda that could be interesting to follow up uh, online. So you can look at that as well. Thank you. So yeah, if uh, Lawrence is uh, not connecting or if we don't have any other information. Um. Sorry, um, just so this is uh, can, uh, sorry, <laughs> Kenneth. This is like my last question or a comment. Okay. Um, regarding the homework that you gave me earlier, uh, to calculate. So I've been using uh, I've been using a software, an open source software, where you can simulate magnetic and non-magnetic uh, uh, particles or materials. So now I wanted to ask you, you said I should calculate the magnetic scattering. So which software will you recommend to do that? Because the one that I'm currently using, I don't think I'll be able to get the scattering of magnetic combined with non-magnetic material, nanoparticles. Because I saw one, it's MEEP, uh, it's calculated. So I what I can answer is, um, ah, okay. So, so I, can, I can answer for you the case for doing the structural calculation, right? So if you, if you remember, I, I, I said I copied a lot of view graphs from a particular website. If you go there, they have all the, many of the different talks have different favorite calculations, some of these things you can actually calculate by hand, right? Sort of where, you know, um, by hand. I mean, we get, we get lazy these days with, calcul with uh, computers, but they are sort of, um, they're directly uh, calculable. Uh, some, and uh, now the, the question, so the, elect the electron density part is straightforward. The, the magnetic part is less straightforward for me but um, it, it depends on how much you know about, you know, how the magnetic vector points and what's the strength of it. Um, you know, the, the cross section is the cross section from the scattering part is actually that part's kind of worked out. And uh, but I just don't know in your material um, how, how strong how strong the magnetic um, uh, field strength is and per, you know, the density of the, uh, right, the magnetic density field strength is. And so uh, um, I don't think, 
magnetic scattering is like a small, small um, subfield. You know, the, the electron density part, there's a huge thing. So there's probably software for, there is software for electron density. Magnetic scattering, I am not sure if there's commercial software for that. You may have to write something. Okay. But, but actually the, the homework I gave you actually doesn't rely on that because the, the homework I gave you was simply to say, okay, if I have the ball of a certain size and the shell is of a different size, it, whether it's magnetic or electronic or whatever, the scattering is going to come a certain place in reciprocal space, right? And I just wanted to figure out, um, is there, are they going to be separate, right? So I, what I want to see is supposing something was scattering in a shell at this distance, where is this, where is the scattering falling? It doesn't matter whether it's magnetic or elect, um, uh, electric, um, electronic. And then compare that with the core, which you, as you said, you know is non-magnetic, right? Uh, okay. And so then I, I, I want, I, you want to have something where the core scattering is low and your shell scattering, find a place where you, you maximize that contrast. That, that, and then it doesn't even matter what the, what the magnetics, uh, how the magnetic scattering is. That would be, going there in reciprocal space would be your best chance to see anything at all. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. I think I, I understand what you're saying. I've done something similar to that, and I think I will, I will mention it on my, on my detailed email to you. Okay. So, yeah, I've done something similar. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. okay, very good. So, maybe we will end here. Yeah. It's a lot Thank of you. extra time, so thanks a lot for your time and your availability. And we will listen more about uh, this uh, wonderful era next week then. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have additional questions, so feel free to send the email as well to okay. Kenneth. That, that's also good. This is very important to get those momentum as well. Right. With, uh, right. The community. So thank you so much. Thanks for hosting me. Um, <laughs> so Kenneth, so please uh, send me your slides, okay? I'll do, uh, I'll do that within a couple, of, an hour or two. No problem. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't hear from me, you know where my I will, I will bug you, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. And bye. Friends, indeed, uh, on the websites. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you.